It's a real joy for me to be here this morning. I'm speaking from London and uh, it's, I am just amazed at the technology. You know, I think right from the beginning, we should just stop and thank God for this amazing technology, which enables us to link across as brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, to link across the world, uh, to be able to share, to learn from one another, and to encourage one another. So I, I'm just amazed and, and uh, overawed at the opportunity uh, to share in this way. Um, and you know, it is interesting, uh, we are in the middle of a lethal pandemic across the entire world. And of course, this is not new. There have been lethal pandemics in the history of mankind for thousands of years. But it's interesting to me that the last really serious lethal pandemic was in 1919, the influenza pandemic. And the question is not, why do we have a lethal pandemic now? The question is, why did God delay the next pandemic for so many years, nearly a hundred years until 2020? And just maybe, Part of the answer to that is that God delayed this pandemic until the technology had advanced to this level of sophistication so that his people are able to meet out and reach out to one another uh, through technology and across the world. And, you know, the Christian church, the Christian community is the only genuinely global transnational community in the world and with this technology we can see that global community in action so uh, praise god for that thank you for being part of this uh, seminar so i just want to very briefly introduce uh, what we are trying to do um, over these next six sessions uh, two today two tomorrow and two on sunday um, and, and the most important thing to understand is that this is like an experiment. Um, I've never tried to do something quite like this before. And what we're trying to do is quite ambitious because I've been asked to give like a crash course in Christian bioethics over six short sessions. So I have recorded a number of videos previously <clears throat> These were recorded uh, for the International Christian Medical and Dental Association. And uh, I am making all those videos. I hope they're all available for you uh, to be able to, to be accessed. Uh, and we will make sure that we provide the links for you to be able to access those videos and to watch them in your own town, time. Uh, what I hope to do in each session is just show one of the videos and then the remaining time of each session will be really for question and answer and interaction. Uh, so could I ask you, please, while you are watching the videos and in, in the interaction, could you use the chat function to put any question that you would like to discuss in the remaining part of the uh, seminar? Just remember that everybody else can see what you're writing. So uh, we, you need to keep to the obvious guidelines about uh, how you phrase, phrase your question. But um, the moderators will then select which questions from the chat room that they will use and, and we'll be able to then have a, have a discussion. Okay, so, so the first video that you're about to see is the first in a series of, in fact, there are 14 videos, I think, in total. And uh, this is like an introductory video and, it, and it, it starts to talk about four big lies that you will in the medical world. What we're trying to do, and this is the theme of the conference, I understand, it is to understand the times. If we're going to be faithful to Christ, we need to understand the times and in the video, I am trying to outline some of the issues that are happening 
in, in healthcare. Now, of course, this was all recorded before the pandemic. And so it will be interesting to discuss maybe how things are changing because of the pandemic. And the other thing to remember is that I, my, all my medical experience is really based in the West, in the UK, and in a highly sophisticated and very secular kind of medical system. And so the issues that I identify are particularly coming with Western spectacles. So one of the challenges for you who are working in Asia is to, to try to see what, how, how does this translate into my hospital, into my uh, medical system? And are there other issues which seem to me to be the central issues which are facing Christians working in an Asian context? So um, I think that's all I need to say now. Um, please write any questions into the chat box. And uh, I look forward to then discussing with you and responding to questions uh, after this video, which just lasts about 15 minutes after it is shown. Thanks very much. This is John Wyatt and this is the first of a series of short video talks on the principles of medical ethics. So we're going to start by talking about the concept of building a bridge between, on the one hand, the world of secular healthcare in which we work, and on the other hand, the world of the Christian faith. Because the truth is, of course, there is a huge gulf between these two worlds. The, the secular world of healthcare is technologically uh, advanced, science-based, uh, post-enlightenment and so on. The, the, the world of the Christian faith is pre-scientific, rural, agricultural. It's a world in which uh, God speaks in thunder and a, and a donkey talks. And so the question is, how can we build a bridge between these two worlds? And that means we need to dig deep on both sides of the gulf. We need to really dig deep into the Christian faith and to understand the fundamental principles of, of the faith. But at the same time, we need to dig deep into the world of modern healthcare and, and, and learn about some of the fundamental issues, challenges, uh, and so on. And, and in this first talk, I'm going to be looking at some of the big lies that lie behind healthcare. It's a concept that comes actually from Hitler. Hitler wrote uh, in the time of the Third Reich that there was no point in, in just putting forward a little lie. You should put forward such a big lie that uh, it was so outrageous that it was likely that people would um, believe you. And this is not a principle that Hitler invented. In fact, the evil one has been using the same principle uh, for aeons. And so it's worth thinking about what are some of the big lies which lie behind modern secular healthcare. And so I'm going to be looking at four big lies over the first two video talks. Uh, human beings are just biological machines. Technology is going to solve all human problems. Uh, thirdly, everybody has the right to make their own rules. I'm the god of my own life. And fourthly, right and wrong are just human inventions. So let's look at the first of these big lies. Human beings are just biological machines. We've always tried to understand what it means to be human by uh, understanding the best science and technology of the age. So the ancients thought that the world was created of fire and wind and water. And earth and so lo and behold they thought the human body was created out of the same things and then in the 18th century it was hydraulics which was the great new idea and then uh, hydraulic metaphors the idea of the circulation the even freudianism is a, is a sort of hydraulic metaphor but now in the 21st century we're in the age of information processing machines and lo and behold uh, we think of the human beings and biology as being basically uh, machines. Uh, we are machine based. Uh, so this is a quote from Richard Dawkins. We're all machines built by DNA whose purpose is to make more copies of the same DNA. This is exactly what we're for. We're machines for propagating DNA. It is every living object's sole reason for living. And so behind this is the worldview called scientific materialism. That, that reality consists of nothing but matter and energy 
and the scientific laws which govern their interaction. And if, if you understand this, this understanding of the body uh, as being a machine uh, t taps into this worldview of materialism. Now, of course, the understanding of the body as a machine has been extremely successful. It's led to many advances in healthcare. I myself, working as a neonatologist in, in neonatal intensive care, have often used machine concepts of physiology, of circulation, of gas exchange in the lungs, of brain function, in order to care for very sick babies. So it's not all wrong, but once you take this idea of, of the machine and you make it the dominant understanding of what it means to be human, then things start to go wrong. And it seems to me that it's almost like that a human being in this way of thinking is like a Lego kit. It's like a, a, a child's construction kit made out of lots of bricks. And the thing about a Lego kit is that you can basically make it whatever you want. A Lego kit has no fundamental order or direction. It's something, the only limitation is in your own imagination. And so you can take the bricks and, and put them together in lots of different ways. And Modern biotechnology is, is really often using the same kind of idea. We can take our understanding of the way that the machine works and we can put the bits together in, a, in any way we like. There is no fundamental um, uh, order or design in, in behind the human body. Of course, this is linked, linked also to the idea of Darwinian evolution, that evolution is a random process which has been going on for millions of years and the particular structure of our human bodies is just an accident of evolutionary history. We could be very different. And so uh, it's simply the random forces going on over aeons and millions and millions of years which have led to the human body. And of course that means that if we want to change the design, if we want to uh, take control over the evolutionary process as well, there's absolutely no reason why we should do that. What's interesting is that in traditional thinking and including in biblical thinking there are these three realities which which are all quite distinct so on the one hand there are human beings who are unique and made in God's image in the cosmos then there are non-human animals who are like our close relatives but who are different from us and then there are machines there are the artifacts that we make with our hands and using our human purposes and our human ingenuity but what's happening in the modern world is that the boundaries between these different concepts are blurring. So what's the difference between a human being and an animal? Well, we're, you know, we're all primates. We've all got the same kind of DNA code. We've, in fact, um, the, the chimpanzee DNA is more than 98% identical with human DNA. So really, there's no difference between a human and, and an animal. Uh, and similarly, what's the difference between a human and a machine? Well, well, we're just computers made out of meat. Uh, but uh, we now have intelligent machines made out of, of silicon. And uh, we understand more of what it means, uh, how our own brains work by looking at computers and so on. So again, the distinction between the human and the machine uh, is breaking down. And what then happens is that the unique identity of what it means to be human is being lost. The second big lie that I want to look at uh, today is technology is going to solve all human problems. So for millions of years there have been the realities of what philosophers call the human condition, the fact that we are frail, the fact that we're dependent, the fact that we have all kinds of, uh, of limitations from our uh, biology. And in the past you just had to accept these kind of problems, problems like infertility, problems such as an unwanted baby, problems such as disability and incurable genetic diseases, uh, mental fatigue and cognitive decline, depression, despair, aging, and so on. What is new is the idea that technology gives us the dream of overcoming these fundamental problems of humanity. We no longer need to accept these as givens. No, no, we have the technology, we can change this. And in fact, if you look at that as a list of problems, every one of them is something that medical technology is trying to address as a way of overcoming these fundamental issues of what it means to be human. And this leads on to a sort of techno-optimism, uh, which, which is very rife in the modern age. I find this actually very interesting and quite puzzling because historically, 
the idea that there was nothing in the universe but matter and energy and we were products of random evolution. Historically, this led to a deep despair, to deep nihilism, to the idea that, you know, that it didn't make any difference. Whatever you did, life was futile, life was pointless. We were all going to burn out in the death of the, of the sun and so on. What is new is now this idea of techno-optimism, that actually we're making a better world. We're making, we're going to use technology to, to solve all the problems of humanity. So when the sequencing of the human genome was announced some years ago now, it was amazing the, 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 the worldwide global coverage of this scientific event, but in particular it was the sort of quasi-religious tones. So the Times newspaper in London said this was a new beginning in which we finally accept that we are our own creators and that we alone have the power to make a better world. So this is a very well-known image. It's the image from the roof of the Sistine Chapel in uh, the Vatican, and it was painted by Michelangelo as a, a picture to, to um, illustrate the creation of the world, including the creation of Adam. And, and so uh, God is creating Adam, the first human being, and uh, the spark of creativity is going from the hand of God into bringing life and being to Adam. Well, not so long ago, The Economist magazine had a front cover and uh, lo and behold, there is Adam, uh, although now he has a strategically placed laptop because modern sensibilities are more sensitive to human nudity than Michelangelo was. But uh, what's interesting now is, of course, there isn't any God, there's no creator, and it's Adam who has become the creative life. And in fact, the, the whole article was about synthetic life, that... Uh, human beings were now had taken on the role of the creator and were creating their own biological organisms. And uh, it talked about the stuff of dreams and nightmares. And one of the quotes from The Economist magazine was, we are like gods, so we might as well get good at being it. You know, we don't have any choice. We have now become the gods of our own universe, so at least we might learn how to do it properly. And so as technology advances, it leads to astonishing potential. Um, so, for instance, for people with severe paralysis, there are now the possibility of using high-tech brain implants to allow them to control uh, arms and limbs, but other machinery, information technology, entirely by thought alone. And you can see how this kind of technology has enormous potential for helping people with severe disabilities. Uh, but at the same time, of course, it's, there's, it's what's called dual-use technology. Exactly the same technology is being developed by military organisations around the world in order to allow soldiers to control arms, to fire missiles, to fly planes, using thought alone, so that their soldiers will be smarter and more destructive than those um, on the other side. So. This kind of technology has a very dark face as well, as we learn to control and manipulate our own humanity. The essence of technology is mastery of nature, and it's mastery of nature as a whole, but also mastery of human nature. And as our technology advances, we get better and better at controlling and mastering our own human nature. And I wonder whether you can guess where the most money is being spent in the planet on enhancing human capabilities, on using technology to make human beings faster and stronger and smarter? And the answer is it's the US military. The US military and their uh, specialist research unit called DARPA is investing uh, hundreds of millions, if not more, dollars into human enhancement in order to try to make sure that um, their soldiers are the smartest, the fittest, and the most uh, destructive. So, of course, the idea is if human beings are merely machines, then the strong can exploit the weak. Uh, and so often, uh, technology has this dark side. So, for instance, you know, as we speak, trafficked organs are being transmitted across the world um, for use in transplant and so on the human organs that have been harvested from, from various donors. But it's very interesting that what you can see is that those human organs, by and large, are passing from poor people to rich people. They're passing from weak people and children into rich and elderly people. They're passing from female bodies into male bodies. 
And so the age-old power structures are being reinforced by this modern biomedical technology. And C.S. Lewis, writing at the end of the Second World War, had these uh, very prescient words. He said, man's power over nature turns out to be power exerted by some men over other men. So whenever we hear about human beings exerting power over nature, you need to think again, how are th is this power being used? And so often it is power by the rich and the strong being used to manipulate and abuse those who are weak and uh, vulnerable. As we will see in Christian thinking, Christian thinking reverses the power structures completely and it is the weak and the vulnerable, widows and orphans and aliens who become those whom God is most concerned to defend and protect. So we've been thinking about how to build a bridge between the, um, the world of the Christian faith on the one hand and the modern, secular, highly advanced and technological healthcare worlds in which we work. And we've been looking at two particular uh, of the big lies in modern healthcare. Human beings are just biological machines. Technology is going to solve all human problems. In future talks, we're going to be looking at Christian responses and a Christian way of understanding what it means to be human. How does this relate to these secular ideas? Uh, in the meantime, here are some questions for thought and discussion. Perhaps you could give some examples from your own experience of machine thinking in healthcare. And, and what are the practical and spiritual consequences if we think of our patients as machines, as machines who are faulty and broken? And then there's that quote that I meant, we alone have the power to create a better world. What do you think are the problems with that way of thinking? Does that, does that actually match with reality? And finally, in what ways do you think that advanced medical technology is reinforcing the power of the strong and the rich over the weak and poor in our modern world? And what are the social and spiritual consequences of this? In the next talk, we're going to be looking at two of the other big lies in modern healthcare. So thanks for watching. So I think this image of the bridge, can we, can we just reflect a little more about this image of the bridge? Because uh, I realize I go very fast in the video. I'm speaking quite fast. Some of these concepts are quite difficult. So let me just try to, to, to draw out a little more about this bridge. The, so the idea is, of course, when we read our Bibles, we are reading about a world which is pre-scientific. It is a rural world. It talks about deserts and fig trees and uh, God speaks in thunder and creates a wind. And, uh, and it, it is pre-scientific, it is pre-technological. And then you think about the world of healthcare in which we work, and it is a completely different world. It's a world of science, a world of technology, a world of um, all, all, all the aspects uh, which I mentioned where, where human beings are thought like machines and where technology provides the answers and so the question is, how do you build a bridge between these two worlds? And to be honest, I think that many Christian doctors, it's almost like they just live in these two worlds. They go to work on Monday and they live in a kind of secular and they talk the same language as their colleagues and they uh, just think in secular things. And then on Sunday, they go to the Christian church and it's like suddenly click. Now I am in a Christian mode and now I talk about faith and prayer and worshiping God and giving my life to Jesus. And this cannot be right. You know, I believe that we must be the same person on Monday morning in the hospital as we are on Sunday evening in the worship service. We need to bring these worlds together. We need to build a bridge. And so what I'm trying to do is to help people to uh, Christian doctors and healthcare professionals to, to, to build this bridge. But in order to build the bridge, you must have a strong foundation on both sides. So of course we must study the Bible. We must try to understand what God is saying and what his truth is revealed in the Bible. But, but also we must try to study the secular world 
we must try to understand what is happening uh, in our own hospitals. What are the forces, the hidden um, power structures, the, um, the sometimes corruption, sometimes um, other things that are going on? Because until we really understand our modern world, uh, we're not going to be able to, to build the bridge. So in these series of videos that I've produced, the first one, I have identified these four lies. And then what we will go on to do is, is look at how we create Christian responses and uh, to these lies. And I, I think the way we do that, again, is we have to turn to the Bible and we have to say, what does the Bible have to say about what it means to be human? Uh, what does the Bible have to say about technology? What does the Bible have to say about morality, about where we find right or wrong? And then what I'm hoping to do is to help people to see, well, how can I be a Christian in my own hospital? How, how can I live in a way which uh, is faithful to Christ? but which is still really engaged in the modern world. So, so that is building the bridge. You know, in the West, of course, every medical system has a different history, but in the West, certainly, and I think also in, in, it's true in much of Asia, the Christian foundations of medicine was very strong. So the, originally, um, hospitals were developed by Christian people, Christian thinking, uh, was in all aspects of medicine. But from the time of the, the Enlightenment, which started in the 18th century, a very different emphasis has been creeping into medicine, which is, as I said, the idea that human beings are just machines, this kind of Darwinist and reductionist thinking, but also the idea that technology is going to solve our problems because they say religion, religion has no value. You look at Christianity, it has caused wars across the world. It is just religious superstition. So we must get rid of Christianity. And instead, we must just use science and reason, thinking. Uh, and, and at the moment in the West, in my hospital, there are still many Christians who are working in the hospital. Um, as doctors, as nurses, as, as paramedics. Um, there are many people who feel called by God who are Christian believers to go into medicine, but the power in the medicine is now in the secular Darwinist thinking. That is where, so Christians are now a small minority. And so, but we can still have a great influence you know uh, jesus said you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world and the interesting thing about these metaphors is that you only need a tiny bit of salt to have a huge effect and you only need a tiny bit of light to light up a huge darkness so even if we are very small in number we can have a big influence in in our healthcare systems and, and thanks to god i see that happening across the world that christians are exerting a, a great influence um, but we have to recognize this is a big gap if you go to your secular colleagues and you start talking about human beings made in god's image and you say the problem is that human beings are fallen and uh, we need to confess our sins and find redemption in Jesus. Uh, they think you're mad. They think this is just religious talk. You know, you're supposed to be a doctor. You're supposed to be a scientist. How can you talk all this religious talk? And, and so this is where the, the gulf is between the two sides. And we need to build this bridge. But it's not easy. I, I want to say... It's not a simple task to be a Christian doctor in the 21st century. Actually, it's never been easy to follow Christ in any century. 
That's right. But in the 21st century, it is particularly difficult because we live in a very strange world, a very rapidly changing world, a world with many confusing questions. But God has given us his truth. He has given us his word. And he's given us many wonderful examples of Christian doctors. I've been I've learned so much. I've had the privilege of watching other Christian doctors in the UK and across the world, and I've learned so much from them. And so I'm keen to try to pass on more uh, to my brothers and sisters uh, to, to try to share how we can learn more to, to be faithful to Christ in a secular health system. It's very important um, for Christian students to really think deeply about ethics because uh, it is while you are young that it's possible for your mind to think new thoughts. I'm afraid to say most of us, by the time we are 40, we are stuck in our ways. Our brains are stuck in certain patterns. And so it's very important while we are young that we build a Christian way of thinking. And in order to do that, we need to study bioethics. But I just want to warn you that the bioethics that is taught in the medical school comes from a very atheistic perspective. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly the bioethics which comes out of the West, out of the UK, the USA and uh, Western Europe has a very anti-Christian perspective. So yes, it's important to study that but we must also study Christian ethics. And that's what I'm trying to do in this talk. And Christian ethics is different from the way that ethics is taught in the medical school. Well, nobody can see the future. And of course, God is in control of his world and he really is in control of the future, including this pandemic. But I believe in many ways, the gap is getting wider and I think maybe we see this in the pandemic because what we see is how do people respond to the pandemic? The answer is technology. Technology will solve the problem of the pandemic. There is no other hope, uh, but if we can only work out how to do testing for the coronavirus and then we can develop vaccines and we can make the vaccines widely available we can develop new vaccine technology then we will solve the problem then the world will be fine and this is a classic example where technology is the answer and so i i think the difference in thinking between the christian worldview and the secular worldview is increasing the the gap is getting bigger but I just want to say I am not in any way despairing about this. In fact, I know that by God's grace, it is possible to cover this gap between these two worlds. And you know why as Christians, we can be absolutely confident it is possible to cover this gap. It is because of Jesus Christ. Because what we learn about Jesus is that he is fully human and he is fully divine. In other words, Jesus himself is on both sides of the gap. He is, of course, fully divine and giving God's true revelation, but he is a fully human being. And because Jesus is alive and is real and is seated at the right hand of God, then we can be confident that it is possible to build this bridge. Uh, but I, I notice one of the questions says, well, how can we do this? Well, I hope as we discuss this further in these videos, you will learn more of how to do it. But what I must warn you is that it involves hard work. If, if you think you can come and just spend a few minutes and learn a few things and then go back and lead your life, uh, and then you will be able to live a life as a Christian doctor, I'm afraid you are in fantasy land. Uh, it takes significant amount of hard work, of reading, of study, of prayer, of discussion, uh, in order to develop a really strong Christian way of living. But it is possible, and I want to encourage you. 
I can help as, as, as much as I can and other people can help you how to be on this journey of learning to serve Christ in the world of medicine.